and welcome. Our next talk is mostly, oh, I prepared something. It's about this. This relatively ugly piece of electronics might also look like this. Jaden will talk about how they work and in the question and answer session will answer your questions. And welcome Jaden to the f presentation. Yeah, hi. As said, I will talk a bit how you can turn a dev board, how you can move from a dev board with cables all around to something proper, looking like this, a proper PCB. However, let's get starting. Um, I'm Jaden, I use female pronouns, I'm 19 and I currently go to school, I'm doing my university entry exam and uh, you can see me on Mastodon and maybe on my website. Uh, once the talk is done, oh, you and you still have any questions, please, please hit me up on Mastodon. What are we talking about? Um, how can I turn all my cables to a proper decision? Do I need all the parts? Is it a good idea what I build? How can I turn that into a PCP design? I can get make get made can have produced. How can I get all the parts and how can I assemble everything to a functioning and beautiful looking result? First of all, we need an idea. An idea I had was back then when displays were an e-ink display was something new. I wanted a proper looking e-ink display and that was the idea I continued with. First you think about what can I do. Usually you have an example uh, uh, circuit in the with the dev board and you build it. In the first method you don't look at details because that will change anyways. So you look at what do you want to do. You create it, on, draw it down on paper. It does not need to be beautiful. It can just be a doodle and you collect more parts to it. You need an ink, you need a battery, you need a CPU. That's the easiest you can do in the beginning. Just draw everything. Then the fun part starts. You have to build it. In the beginning it's a whole mess with cables and a lot of mixed up parts, and, but that's the most fun part of it. And when you have something, you build it, you build it, you test it and start again, again and again. Until at the end the functional, it works. It works the way you think it should work. It probably will take several weeks or at least hours. And with the time you find all the small mistakes. Once that is done, you have an a whole bunch of cables and everything works, but it does not look that good. And how can you turn that, to bring that to somewhere else? I don't want to have the ink display on the table with all the cables. It's meh. Maybe I even want to have it in a beautiful way. And then you get the idea. Why don't I create a PCB? And then the second question is, how do I create PCBs? Is that expensive? Is that complicated? What do I have to think about? And that is something that is overwhelming in the beginning. You get too many resources and informations and they don't agree with each other. And earlier or later, yeah. The first step, you draw the the the, the circuit you have created. You can just you know write Arduino in a block and look just look at the I opened. You can use Eagle from Autodesk. There is a free version. Then there is the free software KiCad, and there are different projects. I did all my projects in Eagle, 
there's a student version that is free and Eagle is a good program. It, if I remember correctly, was free at some point and was bought up. What did I build? Um, I have a dev board here. If I use a Raspberry, I don't recreate a Raspberry Pi. I use it as a finished component because it's quite difficult to create a Raspberry Pi PCB. But if I use an Arduino or something with an ESP, it's usually quite easy. And most dev boards are, have public schematics. The Arduino schematics are publicly available. You can look at them and copy the parts you used. That's the next step. Which parts of the dev boards did I actually use? Usually they are, for example, with the ESP, they have voltage regulators and everything else on the PCB and perhaps use the shield and they have converters on them and everything. And then there's the question and depending on how much you know and if you draw it and look at what the parts do and you just Google, you usually see what is connected to which. So for example, I have an ESP module and then I have a lot of logic metal level converting on 5 volts. And then they have a sensor to in three volts and then convert it back down. You don't need that. It's unnecessary, it's expensive, and it just takes up space. So, with this method again and again, which parts do I actually need? Which parts are redundant in this case? Something that's on there twice. For example, voltage regulators. I can just use one slightly larger rather than having ten different voltage regulators when as long as everything runs on one voltage so that's quite easy it's quite easy to find that and you have to look at the parts available to you but it's quite feasible to optimize and if I don't use parts at all example Arduino um, it is possible that I don't use the USB port and then the question, do I flash the software via USB, but you can also program it through the programming interface and then you don't need the USB interface necessarily. The same with ESP, if you don't want to use something the USB, you don't need the USB and you don't need USB interface and they are quite expensive. The standard USB interface is, that works quite well is not on most cheap uh, China gadgets anymore and it costs a few euros and you only need it for flashing and never again and then the question comes up what do I do with the thing? Again, when I'm using shields all around the dev board are there any special components? Again, looking at the schematics, can turn them into my schematic. And then, and that's a question I have again and again, uh, that I have some strange components on there that I just can't find online. Some strange things. Usually there are ex uh, replacement parts. Sometimes they have a pin somewhere else. or So you can find the alternatives. It's a lot of searching the internet and forums, looking at data sheets. And you sometimes need an hour to find a, a replacement part for one specific part on the original dev board. Maybe you have to change something in the uh, circuit, maybe another resistor or so, but usually it's not hard to work it in, to build it in a way that you have all the parts that you need. At the end, once it's done, it looks something like this. This is an example project, it's an ESP module, and in the bottom, uh, and then there's a strange plus like um, circuit that the voltage regulator for an ink display. 
This is an area where a strange part is. There is this MOSFET that's really strange on the original dev board, and I had to use a different one. I had to adapt the, 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 the circuit, but it works. The parts on the top is a voltage supply, and that's something used for all parts and not just one. On side there is the contact for the ink display. And for uh, you need you, to put your time in for that, and it is art, and I'm really honest about that. You have to redraw it, think about it again, and that's not something you do in an afternoon, but once the first circuit is done, you will notice that probably you have to change something there, but that's the way it is when you develop electronic things. Especially when you start from the beginning, you don't think about every small component. Now that the circuit is done, the more interesting part starts, the design of the PCB. Because, for example, here, um, these two PCBs, one is more than twice as large than the others, but it's the same circuit. They in principle do exactly the same, but the form factor is completely different, and that's the same when you do a PCB design. And again, this is art, it's a drawing. You use your software, you usually the same you used for the creating the schematics and you auto place the parts somewhere and it's roughly placed the way you do it for the schematics that's easier in the beginning you rebuild your schematics with real parts and you can just look at it and compare it with the with the circuit diagram and that's why this PCB is so much larger. I rebuilt the uh, the uh, schematics. And if you're really fancy, you can print the schematics onto the PCB. Um, you don't have to look at the schematics while debugging. Once you have something that really works, that you can debug, and then you can shrink the the uh, electronic part to maybe put it into an existing case or something. Then parts on both sides. In the beginning for debugging it's quite a bit quite bad and even for hand soldering it's it's a lot of work but if you want to put it in a small form factor, if it's supposed to put, fit in a existing case, you can think about it. Many of the PCB design software already know, already can create 3D module from your PCB. That's especially easy because you can just take the design PCB model and just put that in, import it into Fusion 360 and just say, hey, I build uh, the fitting case around it and you don't have to measure and calculate, but you can just import it and use it. That's quite handy. And that's why I, again, why I use Eagle because that's quite easy. It's Autodesk and whether you want to use Autodesk or not, it, it works. I have parts everywhere. They are not connected. And the next step is routing. Um, you connect every part uh, with the parts. The, it might not be the same as the schematics because the uh, connection points of the parts are different than in the schematics. Sometimes you have not connected uh, uh, connections that are not used and with routing you have to connect all the parts and usually the software already draws lines which parts have to be connected where and you and only allows these connections that's quite handy
Und natürlich, was viele Programme auch können, Next, you have to look at, do these connections work at all? Are they looking good? And something a lot of software is able to do, you can do auto-routing. You can, the software does the routing for yourselves, but in the end there is a PCB that's hard to debug. They, it tries to fit it as small as possible, and sometimes there are strange things. Auto-routing does not work that good. You, uh, in the end, you still have to do work. And I would prefer to do it by hand and know where every uh, trace is and what it does. And I don't have to debug the automatically created PCB from some strange software. With larger projects, when you look at a Raspberry, it's different. You have so many connections. You can't just keep all of them in your head and understand them. But with small projects, that's a feasible way, a realistic way. Next step, routing by hand. Um, how does, do you do that? It won't work the first time, because you will have to layer traces and that doesn't work and you won't find a different solution. It takes time, it takes several hours. Even the small PCB I showed a few minutes ago is 12, if not 20 hours of routing until it's in this this form. Maybe I shrank the PCB a millimeter and some things always happen, so don't, don't be frustrated when something does not work. Something you forget in the beginning, uh, PCB is usually dual-sided, so here, where all the parts are soldered, it's one part, um, layer, and on the back side I can also create um, traces. Every software is different, but um, you always have to think about using both layers. If you have something really small and you want to you have it really small, you can add additional layers, three, five, where you have traces within the PCB, but that's quite difficult to debug because you can't see all corrections. And it's quite expensive to have to, to, to have them created. It's like drawing, it's something like art, you have to exercise, you have to get good at it, but you can do it and you get it, get it at the end. No, none of these PCBs follow any norms and usually, for example, this is the drawing of this smaller PCB, it's quite a mess. The blue lines are the back layer, the red lines are the front side of the PCB and everything else is through and the white things are printed text. It's quite messy, but you see both layers and this is the drawing. You draw these lines and you have to you know, do it to, to connect it. The regulations is well a thing. Usually you say we have mass uh, ground everywhere and you just score the the uh, traces you want. But in the end, if a real PCB developer looks at this PCB, he will fall down and. and won't say, hey, that you don't do it that way. But then, for things you want to build for yourself, you don't want to sell, you don't want to use commercially, but something you just want to use at home, just for fun, you don't, it's unimportant whether you follow the appropriate DIN rules. And as long as you don't start with high voltage electronics, you can't don't care about it. Worst case, a uh, 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 component breaks. So, don't be afraid about of from all these norms, regulations. If you really want to sell something, you sh should give the 
uh, you should have the, your have that certified uh, because you need a specific certification to have your own PCB certified and that's something you need if you are in a company and just don't just uh, have a hobby project. As long as it works, that's fine. You, and you don't harm yourself. Something similar as Pico Planet. It's like, uh, it's a project from B Plague. In this case, I don't know whether you know it, but it looks like this is a small PCB. It more looks beautiful than being perfectly designed. That's normal. And it's not... It, you don't need something perfect. It's DIY stuff and it does not work. does not need to be perfect and fitting to all regulations. Once you're done and your design is ready, you take the next step. You have to create it. PCBs can be done at home, it's a lot of work and it's messy and it won't be perfect, especially not the first time. And it's not that cheap. Nowadays it's cheaper to use an online shop that creates the PCBs for you. Most of them are somewhere in China, 30 PCB for example or JL. CPTB. They do that under rather bad, more or less bad circumstances. You get your PCBs quite cheaply and in sufficient quantities. I order 10 or 50 at the time. You usually get 50 of these small PCB I showed you. It were like sixteen dollars, including shipping. It took three, four weeks, but that's the way. You also order all the other parts online, and they take similar times. They use these Gerber files, and they contain everything they need to create the PCB. It's all in this file, or usually it's in several files inside the Gerber file. And I, can I select a color for my PCB? They are Black zip files. Different kind and of colors, you can choose one. You usually get them from There's your software. There's also the pro pro possibility to get some flexible sheets to the... You can, you can just uh, do experiment what you want, if you want to. Something maybe use a flexible thing. And you must uh, be careful with which parts you use, so you don't bend a chip or something like that. But there are many possibilities. I've ordered my PCBs. So where do I get my parts from? That's a step that happens twice. Once when I design the PCB just to see if I can actually get these parts, but then I have to actually order them. There are online shops, I listed some here, there are many shops, there are Germans, uh, Internationals, Reichelt is a German one, Arrow or Mauser are international. You can get your parts there and you have to look where you order them. Yeah, you can just choose, buy your parts as a seller of your choice. You can buy them where you want to, it uh, doesn't matter, parts are the same, if they have the same dimensions at the same values. Important, always buy more parts than you need, something will, will break. All the PCBs I've sh shown you are either un without parts or broken because all the ones that did work, they are built into some devices. If you do it for some time, you will have many broken PCBs. And it's always funny to see where errors happen. Something can go wrong when soldering, more or less that soon it could be that a part is defective or something, a trace is not there on the PCB. Things will happen, don't, don't worry too much, just order more than you need and you'll be fine. 
So, no, I've ordered all my things and I have some time for a mate or coffee or tea or something. Now it will take, depending on where you ordered, take a week or maybe two or three or four until everything is there, if you have all the parts, until everything is there, so that you can start to build. And that is important. Uh, wait until all the parts are there, it's not useful to solder a half-done part. So, what to solder now? You can start soldering now. Soldering is, if you haven't done it too much or if you're just starting again for a long part, it's work, it's real work, it's tiring, it takes time. And you should take your time. You should take a Saturday evening or the whole Saturday or a few hours on an afternoon and then do that. I had the luck last year that I could do that more or less professionally and so I had much time for such projects. But you, it takes its time. If you have done your first two or three versions of your PCB, it will get faster. So print the schematics and the design. It's very practical, very important. Even if, especially if you have access to a plotter to print it in A3 or A1 and put it up on the wall, that is really, really useful. Then you can draw into it like you I have to take care of soldering set. But that part or that part is in bag three. I sorted my parts in bags or in cases and wrote it onto the plan. That makes it far easier to work because the workflow is much faster. There, everyone has to find its own way in its own time how to do it best for yourself. Then one of the basic things is you start with the smallest and the passive parts. Those are usually the cheapest, and that's not so bad if they get too warm for a long time. Just solder them on and look, and then solder on the more expensive part at the end. The, yeah, the most expensive part at the end, so if you destroy the PCB during soldering, the, the expensive part aren't wasted. And then it's S and D. It's more of a design question, but it's important when soldering S and D parts, which I've done. My PCBs are parts that are sit on one side of the PCB and that are very small. If you're experienced with that, you can do it. But a beginner who hasn't soldered S and D, he should probably not do that, you should probably use through-hole parts, they are called, as so, and you can design a PCB with that. It will not be as small as a PCB with SMD parts, but it's easier to solder. But there are many different the sizes of SMD parts. If you look at the lower lower side of a, of a raspberry, there are parts that are smaller than a millimeter. You usually do not want to solder those by hand. There are size guides, some guides you get in, on fairs you can get them. On fairs it's a, like you can, things where you can see the sizes and see how big it is. And if you do not know this, you can find someone in a hacker space, how big you should choose your SMD part if you want to solder is. And otherwise, the size tables are normed. You can look online and then can look what you want, how many millimeters you want, so you can solder is. If you do not have equipment for soldering, which is especially for SMD part, you cannot use a a uh, two euro soldering iron, but you can, should not be a problem, that you can get cheap equipment, some of those kits that can like 20, 30 euros around that. You do not need the Vela soldering iron for 400 euros, you do not need that in the beginning. You will need, won't even need it if you do it for some time. You can just look that you get that one what you need, 
you can, of course, you can go into a hackerspace. They usually have equipment, sometimes even the more expensive good equipment. You can just ask that if you can use that, or if someone can help you, or if you can use their equipment. Or if you can can look if you get some support, there's no problem to just ask. If I'm done with soldering, then before I power it up or do anything, I look at the PCB. Are all connections good? Do they look good? This is especially important if you solder SMD, if you have parts like this here that has a surface length of 2 centimeters, 24 pins. They are half a millimeter apart from another. And you have to look with a magnifying lens that you have not actually shorted those pins. That's a difficult when soldering, but you can do that. If you have done that, then you look where there are no unwanted connections. And then if you've done that, then you should, in places where you're not sure, you should test the connections electricals. Most uh, multimeters have some kind of beep mode where you can just beep through the connections. It gives a, a signal or an optical signal if uh, there's a connection. You should do this, especially for important connections like is plus and minus connected. You should really do that and you should really take the time to do these tests. Then you should look that all parts have good contact. It could be like a cold soldering point that have some electrical contact but have bad electrical contact. But there's a really high resistance in the soldering point and then some integrated circuits won't work correctly. And then if you have all that and you say, okay, I'm sure that this will work, and then I have to admit I've write that I've written that down, but sometimes I just connect it to to power, but uh, it has more than one that it can went up in flame. So if you power it, there are two possibilities. Possibilities: it works, or it's a, it's a steam engine or a fog engine. <laughs> Depending on which parts, which <coughs> which parts have been defective or destroyed. Now the easy thing, if it if it smokes, it's easy. You can see the part that smokes is one that's once broken. But if it just doesn't work correctly, then you have to find out um, which parts didn't correctly work. This is a story from two years ago. I spent like two months looking for an error on a finished finish PCB, and I couldn't find it. And then after two months, I found out that one part I got from my distributor was defective. And finding this error was very, very much work. But then I found it, and within 10 minutes, everything worked, like I worked. Yeah, so it was simple, but it took two months that it, it, until I found this broken part, which I thought had been working. So another problem is the connection might be wrong. This has been the case with this PCB. Uh, you see, well, you probably won't see too much. Um, uh, there's a plug connector. I'm. There's this is a. Uh, plugged in, and that's this with white part. This was mir mirrored in the PCB. But then I had to solder it on reverse. Those errors can happen, and those errors do happen, and, well, you can't do much about that. That's something that just happens. And you shouldn't be sad about that. It happens. Then you can as I said, uh, the circuit uh, is, consists of several parts. The first thing I can look is my voltage supply working. And do, do all parts get the correct voltages? Or the piece is a microcontroller draft. Is the correct software on there? And so and so you can test all these separate parts of the circuit separately. Sometimes it's even useful to just solder on parts of the circuit on the PCB so you can see if does the rest work 
Even when the rest is done, it's also useful to order several PCBs because you need PCBs like to test this, or if you have an SMD, if it's if it's always soldered on, you do not solder it off again to correct something. You just make a new one. To getting them off again, it's really hard. Oh, yeah, if you found you replay the part that were broken and see if it works. Or in the worst part, there's actually an error in the PCB. So in the PCB I showed with the wrong connector, I switched the data ports of these data pins of the USB ports, so it didn't work. There are some tricks to fix errors on a PCB, so you can probably cut some cut some connections with a sharp knife and then do some thin wire to make new connections. That's good for debugging, you can do that. That looks something like this. You see there are parts that are bridged over, there's a bit of wire from the, from one of the circuit, integrated circuits somewhere down to the other integrated circuits and many wires are soldered on to measure some things. It looks like that. And you all see here the, the plug that's uh, soldered on in reverse to how it actually should be. So yeah, it's PCB design is really fun. Yeah, sometimes you have some problems, like it's, it's fun, you have very uh, trips and see. So yeah, it, especially looking back, it's funny. So if you have everything done and everything is as it was and you can just just start from the beginning. I can correct all the errors I found in my schematics, draw it new, and then repeat and repeat and repeat. And then in the end you have like four revisions of the same circuit, but at the end you have something you have just to solder on, put on the program, and that works. And that's a really, really good feeling, but it takes long to get there. So that's what I say. When you're designing PCB, you shouldn't say it if it don't work in the first time. As you can't expect it won't do that. Just continue. Do not lose do not lose the fun. We do that for fun, not because we want to earn money. If you want to earn more money with that, we have other possibilities. We do that for fun and you shouldn't lose the fun if it doesn't work on the first times. Same, same thing with everything, even if your programming is the same. Or if you write software for one of these PCBs, it can happen that things don't work. For example, when developing this project, I switched from C on the ESP mod module to MicroPython because it's far easier to develop with MicroPython. Python because yeah, there are many resources for MicroPythons and the several programming languages on controllers, but just as, just as an aside. So now I have everything done, everything works. I have my four or five revisions, depending on how much it took. Well, yeah, congratulations. You've developed your first PCB that PCB that doesn't work. Yeah, of course. It, sounds easier than it is, and it even doesn't sound that easy. I just skipped over many steps in this. It's much work. It took like two years until I had something that did really work and did, uh, after school. Yeah, but it's something differing, but it's not differing for you up to do that after school or work or uni. But yeah, it may, it's fun and you shouldn't lose the fun and if you stay with it, you will, will make it. That's it from me, what I wanted to do. I've just wanted to give an overview and my idea was that we now speak about projects from you, or ideas or questions or suggestions. So as I said, if there are any more questions after this talk, we can just write on Mastodon. And yeah, and I would. Yeah, are there any questions? If there.
Uh, is interesting and very fun okay, Declan, thanks for your talk. Many in interesting things. There have been some questions yet. I think we just start with the first questions. Then we will be a zufallen. Um, Gibt es denn so Standardnormen für PIN-Belegung? So PIN 1 ist immer Ground, PIN 23 ist immer äh, VCC. Norm, zumindest soweit ich weiß, gibt es da keine richtige Norm. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, we have several questions here. Let's start with the first questions here. Und auch in den Programmen, das ist bei Eagle und bei Keycard sicherlich nicht anders. Man kann beim Hersteller Are there standard norms for PIN um, usage? Is there, you know, PIN 1 is always ground, PIN 27 is VCC? Da hilft einem so ein Programm dann wirklich und man muss das sich nicht alles selber irgendwie raussuchen. Aber eine wirklich. No, there are no real norms that anything has to be anything. That's why for every component you have, there are dozens of uh, uh, um, data sheets and Eagle, and at least, probably Kik. Usually you can get a library you can, uh, with the components of that manufacturer, and there are all the necessary data. And that's where the software is really useful, where you don't have to do search everything, but there is no proper norm for that. Das überall auf der Platine Masse ist und die Datenleitung. Thank you. Next question is more towards technology. Uh, how do you work around HF errors? Platine natürlich nicht einfach irgendeine Seite ist, außer wenn man irgendwie. High frequency is black magic, according to a friend of mine. HF is really, really difficult. Um, that's something I said before. Das heißt, man hat ein Signal im Prinzip positiv seine Welle und dann hat man dasselbe Signal invertiert. Use common ground. Have ground connections everywhere. That there is a lot of ground everywhere on the PCB and the data lines are just. Wie heißt es? The ground planes. So you have very much ground and other things like uh, LVDS, like low voltage digital signaling. Where you have um, have a differential signal, so if there's an error on the on the trace, it will always will, will be removed by the differential signaling. And there are like things like those silver cages that are on the ESP module that you can do can use. But in many, you can could check if you use that. But many parts don't do no longer use need this because they have gotten better. But that's something you have to look at when you're doing high frequency. The next question is in the same direction. How is it about layers? You mentioned several layers, one layer, two layer, four, 18. Is there any best practicing? Well, what I can say, real multi-layer PCBs you find in motherboards or something like that. That's unusual for smaller things because they're really expensive. There are certainly some norms or because those multi-layer PCBs, the layout programs usually can do that in some way with multi-layer PCBs. That's not a problem. You just have to look that you develop this. And, and as I said, debugging this is really hard because you have so many layers. Then we had another question. You said routing is art. I think I got the quotation direct. Do you have um, examples for projects that are more artistically telling? Well, uh, art brings it quite a lot to the point. It's from bleep track. I cannot see if you if you can see that it's Pico Planet from bleep track. It's really really beautiful. It's 
like procedurally generated art on a PCB. It's also semi-transparent. You probably can't see that too well, but that it's really more into the artistic direction. And if you're really doing so like a raspberry or something really big, it's also artistic, but it doesn't look good. It's just a technical art. It's a, in my opinion, it's a form of art that you can really do really beautiful PCBs. Very expensive. There are people who professionally do PCBs professionally, and their their business card is a PCB with some circuit on it. There are cool things. We only have two links in the pad. You can look at after the talk. There's another question or a remark from our listeners on the stream. The info that there's a kit space. Kit space builds from a Git repository. Uh, one one click bomb orders. Does Git Space say something to you? It's just a remark from one of our listeners. Of what we can just show that in the patch. And that the information. I hope I pronounce it correctly. That you can do with 0805. Resisted, it's easy to solder. With the 0603, it's more difficult. Well, my experience is I've soldered everything in 0603. It's a bit fuzzy. You can do that, but uh, yeah, 0805 is easier. So 0603 and the other ones, the norms for SMD parts have these numbers at 0603. Is that what I usually use? There's another remark. There's no clean BGA flux. Is that something you can say something about? No. Okay, if you have other questions, we've had all the questions from the pad. If you have more questions, write them in the pad, and there are other channels, as mentioned, where you can ask more questions. Okay, let me do a final pass over the pad. We've answered all the questions that we had then. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Thank you from me too. I wish you much luck with your hopefully not smoke machines. Yeah, we'll see you again.